Young, we also had eaten. I can still hear my grandmother's voice asking me that same question every time when I visited. Would you like something to eat? In fact, it was the first question she asked anyone. When at home and in my grandparents' house, no matter how tough times were, there was always enough food to share. And one of my earliest memories is having Easter lunch in my grandparents' dining room. The whole family came together. Wooden boards and planks were used in order to make the table big enough for everyone to sit. It was loud, everyone wanted to be heard, and there were laughs and serious conversations going on at the same time. It was always a feast, and in my young eyes, it lasted forever. As I was growing up, I always wanted to recreate those memories because I longed for deeper connection and more understanding. I just never knew how. Until September 2015, when a Facebook friend asked for help. And all of a sudden, I find myself here in the Calais port. I just came off a ferry from England, and I was waiting. After I was picked up, within minutes, we drove into the jungle, the now infamous refugee camp. It felt odd being in a car while driving back into what felt like the Middle Ages. I saw broken tents and shacks everywhere, children running barefooted, and the smell and despair of people living on the local tip was unbearable. There was no official support, and instead of reacting towards each other out of love, we acted out of fear. Never ever were we quicker to build fences and barriers and to justify our judgments of others. The police welcomed everyone with constant harassment, rubber bullets, and the officially forbidden tear gas. I was asked to help set up a small kitchen to feed people in the camp. Our plan was to cook a few hundred meals every day, because we thought it would be all over soon once our governments got their act together. On that first day, I went for a walk, and migrants living in the camp shared their food with us. We started talking, we shared stories, we created bonds, and we realized we had more in common than our differences. <coughs> what I learned was the power of sharing a meal. In those first few days, curious faces popped their heads to the gaps in our marquee. From that day on, we worked together. Many refugees came to help. We quickly went from serving 200 meals to 600 dinners, 600 breakfasts, and many more in between. We only stopped when we ran out of food. Yet, the queues of hungry people kept growing. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, and at the same time, the most beautiful. Many refugees would arrive in the middle of the night, seemingly out of nowhere in the pitch black darkness, and we gave them what we could. And when they were very hungry, they would be brought to our marquee to see if we had any food left. During my first week, one evening, it was about 10 p.m., and I was shattered. A volunteer brought in a young boy. His name was Akil, and we started chatting. He told me he was 15 and from Iraq. He had been traveling on his own for the past three months. He didn't need many words to explain to me. The tough journey, the loneliness and despair he'd been through, Akil lost both his parents at the beginning of that trip. I was fighting back my tears, thinking about my own children. Not knowing what to do or where to go, Akil decided to keep walking because he knew of a school friend who was in Kelly with his dad. The, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, and at the same time, the most beautiful. And Kelly, at that moment I met Akil, I realized I couldn't stop or let go. I had to do whatever I could. Kelly Kitchens went on to serve 9,000 people every week. What kept us going 
were compassionate people who acted out of love. The food we shared and distributed was for everyone, no matter where you came from. We even shared it with the police during the demolitions. The dish we're cooking here on stage tonight, or today, <laughs> is called Kelly eggs, or shakshuka, many men, or spicy eggs, as it's known in the Middle East. And in the camps, this was comfort food. It was cooked and shared very often. Whilst eating Kelly eggs, we shared our stories, our dreams, our hopes, and fears. When you're in a situation stripped away from your labels and without any social pressure, you focus on what you have in common, our shared humanity, not our differences. But this is not a story about refugees. This is a story about the loss of connection. After the camps got demolished back home in London, I started to connect the dots, and I realized what I could do to create deeper connection and greater understanding. So I started Supper Club Compassion. In a world where the growing gap between human beings is ever wider, sharing a meal has the power to shift your perceptions, to expand your views on equality and connection, and to take that away from the table. Sharing a meal has the power to connect you with people from other countries, other cultures, the other side of your street, or even your family. The simple act of getting to know others around the table has transformative powers. And Supper Club Compassion is a movement of people who believe we can create a more beautiful world by the simple act of sharing a meal, whether that's in our homes, in a restaurant, in an open space, or in our communities. So, during the break, we will serve you Kelly eggs, and I invite you to buy a dish and share with here someone today you don't know yet, and have a chat, because compassion is truly delicious. Or, as my grandmother used to say, Jung, we also get to eat. Thank you very much.